It's a sunny, hot day in Forest Grove, Oregon, and welcome to the fourth episode of the I Lit Wit Podcast. I'm James Kundart. I'm Len Hua. And today we're going to talk to you guys about, uh, about two topics, as we usually do, two topics in the news of optometry, and uh, they are going to be... Uh, one is like uh, about posterior capsular opacity, right? Opacification after cataract surgery, which is quite common, right? And the other will be uh, instead of a brand new technology, using an old technology, atropine sulfate, ophthalmic topical solution for myopia control. It's still going? I mean, it, people it, still try? Every yeah. once in a while, people do that because uh, the parenzapine has not come to FDA approval. Yeah, because uh, atropine seems to be like have the best efficacy right in terms it's, it's of the, cr- the cruel to be kind method of preventing myopia wow okay well, let's uh, let's well, give five know. minutes or so to each of these topics and please yeah. don't use this as medical advice without consulting your doctor yeah this is yeah just some uh, interesting update on a common ophthalmic condition topic so so let's start with the posterior capsular opacity as you are aware uh, you sent your patient for cataract surgery and then sooner or later they're going to come back with some opacification and then they may need to have they kind of in a sense, usually when you have patient education, say a second cataract surgery. It right? seems like they, they say it's only 50% of the patients develop capsular fibrosis, but it seems like six months later, it's most of my patients. In they, your case, right? Yeah, yeah. 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 And I'm not doing the surgery, but you know, uh-huh. uh, and I'm not blaming the surgeons, but it seems uh-huh. like most have a pretty regressive scarring or response or something, and they uh-huh. grow that extra layer of skin over the back of their IOL. Yeah, the interesting thing is from study, yeah, as you said, yeah, uh, the study actually only kind of estimate that about, like, what, 25%? After five years, yeah, and that's that but, seems low to me. Yeah, but maybe uh, in this case, this study kind of a uh, patient in term in Japanese population. Maybe the Japanese surgeon is more, uh, I don't know, could be or just or maybe their diet is better or, or over the diet there. or something. If the MDs uh, were here, but, they'd be saying it's genetics. But but then yeah, but but then but then uh, younger patient is actually the 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 rate is actually even higher. Maybe it's kind of explained because their their epithelial cells is more uh, active. And they kind of grow uh, faster, and that's why it kind of account for the higher. Maybe we're getting percentage. cataracts at younger ages in the U.S. Um, maybe due to the high rates of diabetes here. That could be too. And and what they found is that if you're younger than forty, the rate is up to forty percent. We'll get the the PCO. So, in but a regardless sense. of what age you are, if you mm-hmm. have this done, you're running the risk of needing a young laser treatment, and so that. Now there's a lens they say that can prevent that. From yeah. Cancer. So so this this study just came out uh, last uh, what about well last month in a sense July right yeah, in yeah. archive of ophthalmology. So the group kind of designed an E ring. So the E ring actually go around the IOL. So the the purpose of the E ring, as you can see on the picture right there, it's about five nine point five millimeters. So it kind of go around the anterior. Uh, anterior to the equator in a sense, so it kind of prevent the uh, remnant or whatever left over residual epithelial cell from migrating to the back of the lens and transform into a fibroblast and, and then become uh, the cell that start to cause the fibrosis and then that's what you get uh, opacification. So what they found was, that, yeah, virtually, I mean, with this ring around the IOL, it kind of prevent the cell from moving, migrating to the back of the lens, and then you get uh, the problem of PCO solved solve that way. Do you know, Dr. Hua, is this a foldable IOL? Can it be done with the, the clear cornea cataract surgery where you don't require any stitches, or does it need to be a scleral surgery? Because it uh, looks this like is a... foldable. As you can see, there was oh. like another picture that we kind of just cut out. It's just that it's kind of you insert the same thing, you kind of inject it in, and it's foldable. And well, the ring is foldable. Yeah. It seems like a, one of these. Uh, you know, pretty significant breakthroughs in cataract surgery, although I imagine the YAG laser people and maybe even May the not. ophthalmologists who are, <laughs> are making significant money on, yeah. yeah and, and optometry now in Kentucky, opto- in Kentucky and, and Oklahoma, Oklahoma, yeah, Oklahoma, yeah, doing yeah. YAG capsulotomies, they uh, may not be in favor of this as much. But I, I think this is the kind of thing I'd recommend to my patients if it, if it proves not to have any bad side effects. Yeah, I think the bottom line is that the less surgery, the less laser you have on a patient, the less side effect that you're going to get in terms of retinal detachment, in terms of... Uh, vitriol lysis and things like that. Yeah, sure. so and, it's a good thing. And for those that don't know, the egg laser is painfully bright, requires usually non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drops after its use, and, and uh, if the surgeon's not careful, they can pit the IOL uh, by, yes. by aiming a little off on their uh-huh. depth, and that, that uh, while it may not be visible um, to the patient as a focused image, it will scatter light. Yeah, uh, or even the vitreous if you go to posterior to the capsule, right? Okay, next topic. 
I like yeah, so whoops, we skipped the slide. Yeah, atropine. So this is, a, now I'll just make the note here. This is injectable atropine that's used, I think, for when a nerve gas attack or something for our soldiers at war. Uh, this is not the atropine we're talking about. We're talking about the drop, right? We're talking about I put that on there and, to get people's attention. And, and what? Is it 1%? Topical 1% atropine sulfate ophthalmic solution is what, you know, we've been using it in the amblyopia treatment studies as, uh -huh. a, as a liquid patch, if you will, for atropine penalization. Oh, a liquid uh, patch. That's of a time. sound eye in, in, in amblyopia. Probably a topic we should we should talk about one of these days. Mm -hmm. But uh, but it's also used OU in the absence of amblyopia for early onset myopia, mm -hmm. what we might call galloping myopia, mm -hmm. where uh, I, I, one, a patient I saw the other day is a first grader, Asian patient, uh, who who uh, developed four diopters of myopia by Whoa. first grade. Wow. Age six. Okay. And a little girl. And we know that girls tend to develop higher amounts of myopia than boys. Uh -huh. uh, and although they, they're, they're, their growth and development happens a little earlier uh -huh. in terms of myopia and other things. But we can predict if she's starting at four diopters that she's probably, if we let it alone, you know, and, and most of the time what else can Half you do? Half to one per year. Yeah, she's, she's going to be pushing double digits, you know, and, uh -huh. uh, and her parents uh, certainly uh, were, as I recall. Uh -huh. So so we know it's epidemic among Asian populations, mm -hmm. large amounts of myopia. It's, in fact, it's changed the, the numbers game. It, mm -hmm. We used to think it's 25% of the population with myopia, and that was true um, in the study he's done in the 50s and 60s mm -hmm. but nowadays it's if both parents have it it's upwards towards 75 percent wow. or so okay so in any case uh so what what is this like you take atropine sulfate we, we all know it can dilate the pupil cause mm -hmm. dryasis for up to a couple weeks and a dark mm -hmm. iris so how often do you use it then you don't have to use it every day uh, in fact, we know that the cycloplegia is less long-lasting than the madriasis. So you, mm -hmm. you've got a 48 hours or so of effective cycloplegia. Okay. Uh, the, the main side effect is not well, the, the little rhyme we might have learned in pharmacology. Okay. I don't know if you still teach it, Len, in yeah, your class, yeah. but the, the red mm -hmm. is a beet and mm -hmm. the dry is a bone and mm -hmm. the mad is a hatter. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, it, I, I had atropine myself as a, as mm -hmm. a youngster, and I, I know that my cheeks did flush mm -hmm. briefly for mm -hmm. 30 seconds or so after mm -hmm. administration. I don't remember having cotton mouth from it. Mm -hmm. And I don't remember developing any nervous tics like mm -hmm. the Mad as a Hatter uh, memory device would have you think. But Not everybody, but it could happen. So yeah, that's but, why it but was the, around. But the noble mm -hmm. side effects, uh, mm -hmm. even with punctal occlusion, the noble side effects are you're going to be blurry up close. That's mm -hmm. how it seems to work. Mm -hmm. There seems to be a, uh, you know, there's an electrical signal between the ciliary body continuous with the uvea, mm -hmm. that uh, which is the vascular tunic of the eye, mm -hmm. that, that may well be releasing what they're calling, for lack of a better term, retinal growth factor. Mm -hmm. And this mysterious neurochemical soup, uh, you know, mm -hmm. electrical signal, it, it, it has something to do with the standing potential of the eye and the mm -hmm. e EOG, uh, and it's transmitted somewhat along the, M the Mueller cells in the retina, mm -hmm. they go the full thickness, but this may be um, uh, arrested if you stop the ciliary body from functioning. So, and, so in a sense, it may kind of uh, hinder or stop the sclera from growing. And, and the scleral stretching that occurs mm -hmm. that's ir irreversible uh, doesn't seem to occur as fast with atropine administered at least, we, we often start for, for mild to moderate myopia on weekends, twice a week, but uh, this every other day are the studies I've seen. Every 48 hours, one drop out between sulfate. So did you try it on this goal? So uh, we did try it for, for a time. Uh, unfortunately, the parents and the, uh, the, the primary care eye doctor didn't, were afraid of the drop uh, uh -huh. and did not want to continue. So okay. she's, she's going to, I'm afraid, uh, short of having some kind of orthokeratology, she's going to be uh, doomed to... Uh, Large amounts of myopia. Okay, so uh, so how old was the patient again? Six. Six. So old, okay, a little bit early, right? Yeah, I, I would think that's going to be a, a tough sell for yeah. for them. I, now, of course, there are the known side effects from atropine uh, mm -hmm. that may make it effective. Also, require treatment. So when you do this to someone, you need to put them in a bifocal, mm -hmm. or if they have the right amount of myopia, they can take off their glasses to read. Okay. Uh, they'll need a full 250 or maybe a three diopter ad for very short arms on a little kid. Okay. And they're going to need sunglasses or transitions, photochromic Just lenses, that kind of thing. Be, if, unless you're in Oregon during the rainy season or, or okay. in the North Pacific still, Northwest, yeah. you, you still you'll, you'll need, kind of thing, yeah, right? you'll okay. need some kind of, I mean, polycarbonate has great UV okay. protection even in, in, when it's clear, uh -huh. but for comfort. You okay. would want to have some in the sunny parts of the the world. You want to have some kind of. What about uh, cosmetic tint. too? Tint would help, right? Well, I mean, you know, yeah. I found it less of a problem to to atropinize both eyes than uh -huh. I have to atropinize one. Okay. When when I'm treating a kid for amblyopia, I often have to send them with a note to the school nurse saying uh -huh. this kid has not developed a brain tumor. If they fall down on the, uh -huh. on the playground, they're supposed to have one blown pupil uh -huh. that will not react to okay. light. Okay. Okay. But with both eyes, you know, you might recall uh, atropine is derived from belladonna. It's a belladonna alkaloid. Uh -huh. Belladonna uh -huh. in Latin means pretty lady, and uh -huh. it was thought in ancient 
of times that beautiful crushing the, uh, the the Veldana leaf, which is poisonous to ingest in large quantities, would would make you beautiful because uh, no one like you know the sympathetic nervous system reacts reaction uh, to love is to dilate pupils. So. Oh, cool. <laughs> okay, interesting. So I mean, my uh, myopia is a big uh, feel and it's evolving, it's progressing, and and it's, it's right now. I mean, I think atrophy is kind of out of favor because of uh, some of the side effects it's, and because yeah, of some it's in favor thing. for it's in favor for a, but, for amblyopia treatment on the but, short term yeah, in one eye. Yeah. But you're right. I mean, it doesn't look yeah. like carenzapine is going to be. It's been dropped for no. uh, FDA approval in 2006, and uh, atropine it does require a decade during the growing mm -hmm. years of of every other day use, along with reading mm -hmm. glasses, along with um, sunglasses. Some fear a rebound effect when it mm -hmm. is is no longer used. Yeah. But I, I think yeah. that only happens when it's discontinued still during the growing years. Yeah. Uh, and I think that there's been literature to prove that. And there are cases, mm -hmm. including identical twins, where mm -hmm. the uh, twin with the atropine used during the growing years will have half the myopia Compared uh, to of you. the yeah. uh, monozygote mm -hmm. <laughs> twin. Mm -hmm. So, so, so it's, it works, right? But it it's, works. Just, it's just like because of the scary in terms of the size effect that a lot of people are not doing it. And then the trend right now is more toward like multifocal contact lens, uh, more light out, outside activity. correcting peripheral blur, blur with, exactly. with things like ortho -K, yeah. reverse geometry okay. lenses. Yeah, so yeah. you're right. Everyone all says is go play outside. Yeah. We all know that myopia in, yeah. in small amounts is the cure for presbyopia. Uh -huh. And so we have to remember that, uh, you know, as we go into a computer society uh -huh. and we want to be able to use our uh -huh. iPad or whatever is around uh -huh. when we're old, uh -huh. um, myopia is the only way we can do that without okay. correction if we have the right amount. Good. Cool. Okay, so the next two topics next week. Yeah. Uh, next two weeks or so. You're, you're going to tell us something about an update on uh, what causes pseudotumor cerebri. Yeah, we're, we're going to just do a quick update, and that's a topic that, that we, we see patients in with like swelling nerve, trouble edema. And, and then another topic maybe we're going to talk about is in terms of what? Yeah, myopic staphyloma and how that can affect the blind spot. And I might, I might sneak some stuff in there about what we're doing with the amblyopia treatment studies when we find that somebody looks like they have a refractive amblyopia, but in fact have an optic nerve hypoplasia or a okay. similar thing. Okay, interesting. Okay, we'll do that. All right, for the Eyelidwood Podcast, I'm Dr. James Kundart. I'm Dr. Lan Hua. And we'll see you online. We're getting